following interview was conducted with Professor Austin L. Shelley, Professor Emeritus of Electrical Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, November 20th, 2008 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and thank you for coming. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years. Well, I was born on a farm just west of New Ross, Indiana. April 9th, 1922, and uh, my father was a farmer, and uh, my mother was a housewife. I have uh, one sister, which is 12 years younger than I am, and... Uh, Did you go to school near there? I went to school at New, uh, New Ross for the first eight years, and then uh, my parents dug up the money someplace to pay tuition and send me to Crawfordsville High School uh, for the last four years. Mm -hmm. So I went from a class of 12 at New Ross to a class of 150 in Crawfordsville, and it uh, was quite a... Uh, sensation. I bet. <laughs> Were there some activities that you would uh, join? Any clubs? At that time, activities? Student clubs, anything like that? And that, did you have, did you, how did you get back and forth to school? Did you take the bus? Or did you? Uh, the bus part of the time, and part of the time I rode with a lady who worked in Crawfordsville. Oh, good. So it was a 10 mile trip uh, in, and of course I had to take my lunch. And uh, then when I was over, I rode back with her and walked a half a mile, five eighths of a mile up the gravel road to the house. And at one point in time, uh, my father was supplementing his income by working at Allison's in Indianapolis. So he did the milking in the morning, and I did the milking in the evening. And uh, it was a rather uh, pioneering existence because we did not have electricity in the farm. We did not have central heating. We did not have inside plumbing. So... Uh, What'd you do the cooking on? Uh, one of the big stoves? Or? On the stove. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My mother did the cooking on the stove, and we heated water for baths and things like that. Uh, but uh, we didn't have a shower or a bathtub, so <laughs> as I say, it was a rather Spartan existence. There would be uh, uh, construed as such nowadays. But but you got along. What was it like during the '30s? And was it the Depression effect? Uh, oh any yes. Oh. oh yes. Did you make any couple comments on that? How did it affect it affect your family? Well, you know, I never had a bicycle as a boy, a two wheel bicycle, because we couldn't afford it. And at uh, one point in time, my grandmother passed away, and. My father decided to buy out her husband's portion of the farm, and I remember the mortgage was only $2,100, but uh, it was very hard to come by. Unbelievable, you know, if you lived in those times. And as I said, it was a big shock to go from a class of 12, where I was the third person on the honor roll, to <laughs> Crawfordsville High School with 150 and so on. But uh, to make it even more difficult, I guess, my father had gone in and he had laid out all of the courses that I would take for all four years. So there was four years of English, there was four years of math, there was, his, er, there was chemistry, there was physics, there was no good courses. <laughs> on what he laid out. That's and very interesting. So picked out a year of uh, like, you know, a year of Latin for me, which I oh I hated that stuff. That but, that course was always a challenge. 
<laughs> I took it. But he told me that uh, it was the basis for all other courses, and English courses and so on. Sure. But uh, later on, when I went to college, I picked on German rather than uh, the, uh, the Latin. I didn't, <laughs> didn't want more to do with the Italians. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, well, when, uh, well, when you graduated from high school, did, is that when you came to Purdue? Or tell us what oh, happened no. after? Oh, okay. no, no. I graduated from high school in 1940 and uh, went to Wabash for two years. And I can't say enough complimentary about Wabash. As a liberal arts school, it, it, uh, I look back on it and that's the one I look at real fondly. But in uh, 1942, I got the draft notice, and for the next four and a half years, I uh, was the property of Uncle Sam. What branch of the service were you in? Well, if you look at my physique and so on, you'd be surprised that I spent the first nine months in the military police. And uh, then they came along with some sort of a test program that the CO sent me to and uh, uh, it was really uh, a repeat of what I had the first two years in college. And I scored so it was an educational program of yes, some sort? Yes, huh. it was the uh, ASTP program, Army Specialized Training Program. And uh, there was only two of us in our unit that passed that and they sent me to Ohio State for a review course. Uh, and we were there for a few months and then they sent me to the University of Kentucky and I was there for a year and a half before they disbanded the program. And when they disbanded it, uh, they ended up sending me to Camp Crowder, Missouri. And there I took a radio repair course and some Morse code which drove me nuts. And uh, then somebody from Fort Knox came out and wanted a radio repairman or something like that, and I went back to Fort Knox and finished up there. Interesting. So all of that consumed about four and a half years. Oh. That program that you were in, what would you have been certified for? I mean, what was the p purpose of the program? You mean the, the specialized program? Yeah, uh-huh. We were supposed to be commissioned okay. at the end of that. And I don't know they. I don't know whether they had thought what they were going to do with us yet or not. But uh, that was the goal of it, anyway. That was the sure. goal. Okay. As far as I, we were concerned. All right. Okay. So after I was discharged, I remember coming up to Purdue and talking to the admissions people here. What year was this in, 1945 or? It's 46. Okay. And at that time, uh, Purdue was using every out or inch or square space that they had in order to house people. They were even putting them in Lambert Fieldhouse. And uh, they weren't interested in having <laughs> one more student. <laughs> they had all they wanted. So I went back to the University of Kentucky and there they remembered me, and the real flood of discharges hadn't reached there yet at that time. So the class that I was in was about 20 in electrical engineering, because that's what I studied while I was in Kentucky. And uh, so I, they told me it'd take me exactly a year, and. Uh, so I put in four quarters there and graduated in uh, August of 1947. Oh, good. What was the campus like then? Was it uh, not as, as crowded as Purdue, perhaps, or? Uh, at Kentucky? At Kentucky, yeah. No, hmm. and the engineering program at Kentucky was not as large as it is here. Okay. And still isn't. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, it was comfortable. Right. Did you and live on campus when you were no, there? Housing was not a problem. I had uh, uh, 
uh, a friend of mine that had been in this ASTP program with me at Kentucky he had come back there to finish up, and, uh, and I roomed with him. Oh, good. Okay. And you had you had the GI Bill. Yes. And uh, two quarters into that year, uh, or maybe it was one quarter in, I had started working in the engineering drafting department at Kentucky, uh, working over plates and doing grading. When the department head from Double E came through and happened to see me doing there, asked me what I was doing, and I told him. And he says, well, we need people over on our side. And I thought it might be expedient for my future <laughs> if I took him up on that. So for the last two quarters that I was there, and they were just then getting a big influx of uh, discharge people. Veterans, huh? And uh, veterans. So I taught courses in double E. And Somehow or another, it uh, sort of caught on, and uh, I liked what I was doing. And a for I don't remember the occasion, but a department head from Mississippi State College came through and offered me a job when I graduated. So I went to Mississippi State College for three years, and at the end of three years. It it was obvious that to get ahead in the academic field, you needed advanced degrees. So I applied to Purdue and was accepted. So you came here. So I came here. And, uh, Had the campus changed a little bit? Well, what year would this have been? Maybe in the 50s, 1950? Yeah, 1952 when okay. I graduated with a master's. Okay. And from Purdue? From Purdue, yes. Right. Okay, good. And... Uh, I could have gone back to Mississippi State, and I think I even had an offer from the University of Kentucky at that time to come back to them, but uh, I decided since I was here, maybe I ought to finish out the PhD, and I did, and before I finished that out, then I was offered a job here, and I would have to say that uh, the completion of the Ph.D. and knowing that uh, uh, I had a position here was uh, certainly a, a relief. I would think so. Yes. And it was close to, because it was still... And I was close to my folks. And the farm. And the farm. Sure. And uh, by that time, my wife's... Were parents, you married it by that time, or...? I had married the second year I was in Mississippi. Okay. Did you meet her down there? No, oh. no, no. I had known her before I went down there. She was the secretary in my uncle's law office in Crawfordsville. Okay. And I used to, when I was going to Wabash and had time off, I would usually go into the law, law his law office and maybe build a fire for the morning and, and uh, get uh, warmed up and then I'd go over to campus and come back and so I met her there. Sure, okay. And her folks had uh, lived in Crawfordsville at that time, but then subsequently had moved to uh, uh, over by Canton, Ohio. And, uh, but uh, they were still here when I came back from Mississippi State one time and suggested to her that maybe we'd get married she was uh, naive enough to go down to what I had referred to as a graveyard in the middle of a swamp in Mississippi State. And, uh, yeah, it was a different existence because uh, this was way before any equal opportunity came along. So the blacks were somebody else down there. And uh, not only that, we were in the heart of the hard shell Blue Baptist community. The county we were in was dry, but they voted, uh, you know, what was it? They, they 
voted dry, but they drank wet. And uh, it, it was an interesting experience. I imagine. <laughs> there, in the school, was it co-ed? It was co-ed, but all, all Caucasian, all white in the school, <laughs> Mississippi State? It was all... It was all white. Uh, when I said Hard Shell Baptist Community, I meant it because Mississippi State College for Women was 20 mile away. Oh, okay. Okay. Now there were uh, a few co-eds at state because this was the only place they could get engineering. Okay. But uh, and maybe a few other things, but. Uh, I would imagine that today it uh, is kind of all co-ed. So I would imagine. Was it, would that University. have been the land-grant school then, Mississippi yes. State? Okay. Okay. But if you're familiar with Mil uh, Mississippi politics and so on, you know that the uh, Senator Bilbo at that time <laughs> uh, was the raving discussion of the community yeah. and I was interested to know that my landlord down there said that uh, when I brought up his name, said that, well, we just keep sending him back to Washington every year and that gets him out of the state. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the way to do it. <laughs> if yeah. it can be done. So, so mm -hmm. uh, yes. So now uh, you're at Purdue and you're on the faculty in Double E, right? And tell us a little bit about that. And well, then uh, not immediately. No. It took me a couple of years. To, oh, that was a surprise, too, when I got up here. Uh, I thought I had a quarter-time appointment. Oh, when you came back for the graduate work? Yes. Oh. Uh, quarter-time teaching assistantship, and when I got here, uh, it, it suddenly changed to half-time. <laughs> so I, it took two years to get my master's degree, and then uh, I started on the doctorate, and that took until 1958, six years. Because in the meantime, uh, uh, I lost a professor. He went to industry at that time. I would say that was a turning point. Uh, now, that's my opinion. Uh, there are probably others that wouldn't agree with me. But uh, I perceived when I got here that Purdue was a teaching institution because there wasn't a lot of research going on in Double E at that time. Very little, as a matter of fact. And this caused sort of a break with the faculty that was here and the faculty that came in, the new people. And the new people wanted the research and the, the senior staff didn't. So I, I think I hit a uh, breaking point right in there. Mm -hmm. About that time, Dean Potter retired, and uh, did you ever meet Dean Potter? Oh yes, okay. you could. Can you make a couple comments on? You couldn't be here without uh, meeting Dean Potter. I recall, <laughs> as a graduate as teaching assistant, I was. Uh, I guess they just called it teaching assistants at that time. They didn't call them graduate teaching assistants no, until later. Uh, I had a class done in the old machinery lab, which I later remodeled, <laughs> or was in charge of remodeling. And uh, Dean Potter walks in one day, and I don't know who the, he was, but he asked me a lot of questions, and he was all, he was an a hands-on individual. We have the Potter papers, which yeah, is nice. Yes, he was a hands-on. And he had but, one, he had a daughter. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I wasn't familiar with his family yeah. or anything like that, but uh, he was a hands-on, and there were all kinds of stories going around about the dean. And he definitely was hands-on. Sure. All right. Okay. So, uh, but about that time, when he retired and, and Hawkins took over, uh, we started going more and more gung-ho research. And so I think that was a, a mm -hmm. break in the action there. Okay. Who was the head of the school at that time, for you call? Ewing was the head of the school when I came Double here. E? Yes. Okay. 
Yes, in the course of my stay here, I think I tallied up one time, I worked for something like uh, 13 heads, interim heads, acting heads, <laughs> so forth in the course of time that I was there. That's pretty good. Well, tell us a little bit about what, then you became uh, about associate head. Do you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, no, that associate head is not the right title. Okay. I, I was what they termed as an executive assistant to the head. Okay. And that started in 1964. Do you know how, do you recall how that came about? Did they, was it a new position or had it ex No, uh, Professor Canfield had been in that position. And uh, I had started counseling students, or being active in the counseling part, and they had a slot that was in between the graduating seniors and the first semester seniors, and that was the spot that somebody put me in. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And uh, what about the co? Excuse me. What about the co-op program? Was did was that did that exist at that time? Were you that involved? existed at that time? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you were you involved with that at all or not okay. really? Okay. Not really. No. Uh, Jim, Professor Bowman was in charge of the co-op program at that time, and then subsequently Professor Lamoth took it over. Okay. Well, tell us a little about what your position, what the duties were with the executive assistant. Well... Did you do s scheduling, course scheduling, space scheduling? I was, yes, we had lost a... Uh, scheduled deputy rather suddenly and uh, the individual that had been hired to do that job uh, was well he didn't do it and at the last minute we found out that uh, we didn't have a schedule on the books and not only that but he had given away all the good times <laughs> the prime times as you might say and uh, so we had to piece things together, and it took the former scheduled deputy who was getting close to retirement and the individual who had been assigned to oversee this fellow and several of us to put together something that would work in a short period of time. Get and the chestnuts going out of the fire. Yes, and at the end, it ended up in my lap. <laughs> and uh, so I got to work with the uh, Jim Blakesley and scheduled the space right. for many years, and uh, Norm Parkhurst in the registrar's office, and the people in the admissions office. And uh, I guess at the peak of the situation, uh, I was in charge of the service staff, the clerical staff the TAs and the IRAs from the standpoint of their salary and so on, in addition to the scheduled deputy duties. And did you do the teaching uh, assignments, the assignment for the teachers? For yes. You did that? Yes. Made you had teaching. a lot on your plate. <laughs> and you wouldn't want to see the sheet. <laughs> but... Uh, it was, uh, well, when I retired, it uh, looked like all of these things here. Wow, that's a lot. That's what about the enrollment in the school? Did that increase? And what that, that was some of the other increasing at okay. the time. Okay. It was increasing at the time. Did they have um, day on campus, which they have now? I mean, uh, you were doing counseling of students. What about before they came here? Would they go to, they went to freshman engineering? Freshman engineering, yes. Okay. Al Smalling, you right. remember okay. Al, was in charge of freshman engineering at that time. And I think each school had a representative that put in some percentage of time there. I, I didn't do that. I was on a committee at one time that 
reviewed what they were doing and sure. freshman engineering okay. and so on. And did you did you continue on with the counseling of the students yeah. too? Did you have any anybody helping you do that? Yes, we had uh, somebody that counseled the sophomores, somebody that counseled the juniors, and uh, then I guess ultimately I ended up with all the seniors both mm -hmm. the first semester. And so okay, on. okay. And at the time I had retired, I think I counted up that I had certified 8,200 and some odd students for commencement. <laughs> Degrees. Very. Let's talk a little bit about commencement. Were you involved with the commencement at all, the, the ceremony and anything of that sort? Yes. Okay. Uh, early in my time here, at, uh, even back in the 50s, uh, needed extra money. Somebody talked me into signing on at the Hall of Music to work the shows. And about the same time, they talked me into working with the athletic department. So uh, this fall will have been my 55th year of working football games because I've continued some of these things after I retired. Super. And I think uh, maybe 51 years of basketball, and I put in 42 years as in the music hall. I started as a head usher in the second balcony, worked my way down to the, or, yeah, to the first balcony, and then down to the main floor, then went back to the second balcony as the supervisor there, then the supervisor the first balcony. And uh, finally, uh, ultimately, became the assistant house manager. Where do, where do you do it for the football? Where are you uh, stationed there? What do you do for well, that? Well, I started uh, ushering in the, the football stadium. Okay. And then the individual that was in charge of ticket sellers was a double E professor, and he talked me into coming over to the ticket selling business and uh, so I have worked as the ticket seller and I forget now exactly what year it was I uh, instead of taking the crew that they already had there uh, they I let they let me hire people for that job so I I guess ultimately at one time until two, three years ago, I was in charge of all events that sold tickets. That was baseball, basketball, softball. Uh, all sporting events? All sporting events where oh. they sold tickets. Very good. And some of those I stayed on after I retired. And I stayed on the music hall until '96, and I still work some athletic events, not all of them. It was three years ago they hired another uh, an assistant ticket manager, mm -hmm. and uh, at that time I had been off campus for so long that I had lost a lot of contacts with people. And when people either retired or moved away or didn't want to do it any longer, I couldn't hire. I didn't know people well enough right. that I would hire them. That happens. And uh, so I uh, said I would stay on a little longer. But uh, Do you still go to some of the events, though? Uh, some some of I, I particularly like baseball and, and uh, the women's softball, and I frequently soccer too and sure. I uh, still go out to those events but I just don't sell tickets anymore. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. did, um, when, in, when you were with the double E, what was your, did you have any contact with the alumni? Uh, in any, they, maybe just when they came back on campus or? <sighs> there was a period of time there when I had uh, the responsibility of 
digging up names and information for honorary doctorates in engineering. What about the DEAs? Were you ever involved with that? The Distinguished Engineering Alumnus yes. Awards? Yes, I, I dug up information and uh, there was at one time <laughs> that I wrote up all the profession, very, the promotion documents for everybody in the school. Wow. You were just a God, man on the, on the front line there. I was glad to get rid of that job. That's you not... Can cut, you can scratch that part out. <laughs> Did you uh, serve on the committee too, the promotion tenure committee? I was uh, secretary of the curriculum committee, secretary of the graduate committee uh, for more years than I care to count. Uh, uh, I sat on the executive committee, which was the department head and the chairman of the various committees. And then there was another committee that I sat on with the head and the fiscal part of it. Mm -hmm. There was even one year when I did the budget for the whole school. Boy, you got a lot there. That's just great. Uh, on the commencement, which you were involved with the tic tickets, is that what you would do? Or, the, or, the, or was it, how about I the reception was, or I was, for the school? I was in charge with of the seating. I would go to the registrar and find out how many candidates each school had. Uh, I would then tape off the auditorium for, the, for each session. I would uh, get the crew together, because we had to have, oh boy, I forget the exact number, sure. around 30 people, I would guess, okay. offhand. And then I also had uh, a couple of students that I would hire to handle the programs and have them in the right place and, and uh, work very closely with the registrar's office sure. in that. Did situation. they still line up in the armory? Yes. Okay. And in those in those days when you started, was it just the spring one, just the ones in spring, or were you also doing the August and December? When I first started, it was just spring. And then about the time that, uh, I don't recall exactly what year, I could go back and look it up, but uh, uh, then we started with the August and December commencements. Sure. Um, did were you any connection at all with the regional campus commencements, or they handled those? No, that was oh. totally separate. Separate. Okay. I think it was someone told me it might have been during Dr. Baring's administration when they may have gone to some others. But you, other than that, where they would have in the spring, would they have more than one, like oh, a couple yes, of we times? Had, yes, we had being four. the only time in the year where they would have it. We had four. Okay. In the spring, but uh, uh, but. Uh, we had two in, two in December and one in August. Okay, that's what we're having now. That's right. And yeah. This uh, involved going to the president's office and finding out how many tickets Mrs. Beering wanted reserved in the first balcony. And one year when the first balcony was under uh, construction, or not, not construction, but renovation. Were, renovation. <laughs> Uh, we had to move her down on the th first floor, and I remember Roy Johnson asking me where uh, <laughs> where would I put her, and I said, it ain't place she wants to be. <laughs> pick, pick a spot. <laughs> yes, oh. yes. <laughs> so uh, it was all very interesting. Yes. Because... Uh, Another thing that I did that uh, I think was unusual for a faculty member, maybe, was uh, I bowled with the uh, in the Purdue Staff Bowling League, and this uh, let me become acquainted with people in other areas of the university that came in very handy later. That's right. And. One thing I liked about working at the music hall was uh, when I first started there, we had people from every rank, 
professors, the service staff, workers, and janitors, everything else. But it all went together as a unified piece. But there was never any rank pulled on anybody, or I'm a further up the line than you sure. are. It was just a continued, and that even playing field. Yes. Oh, yes, and it, it's very nice that way. That's right. Yeah. And. Uh, one of the disadvantages in there, though, is the elevator. It's hard to, you know, get, you know, there's a lot of walking when you have to go up to the balconies. Because we went to a performance and we were in the second balcony. <laughs> we think there's somebody on the stage, but we're not sure. <laughs> oh, I went up there every performance, <laughs> just to keep in shape. <laughs> but uh, there was not even a, a freight elevator in that building, so all we projection equipment had to be carried up there and any remodeling or renovation that was done up there it all had to be carried up wow. brute force and labor wow Ooh. that's a bit um, um deans that you served under was it hawkins and then uh, who uh, was dick, dick grosh dick grosh okay, and then john hancock john hancock and then what been henry yang henry yang and then dick no, that's it oh okay then Oh, I and I think Dick Schwartz came after Henry Yang. I think so. Right, yeah. Now, I served under Schwartz with a, as a department head, and I served under Hancock as a department head. And, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, freshman engineering, could you, uh, just a comment on that. You had some contacts with them, um, and you indicated earlier that a representative from each school was over there counseling yeah. the students, et cetera? I didn't, uh, I didn't you actually counsel, but I I was on some freshman engineering committee at the time that Spalding was the head there, and we met, and uh, there was always this ruckus about freshman physics and freshman chemistry and freshman math, you know, too many people were biting the dust in there <laughs> and going to other schools. and. And so on, and so we were always reviewing. Uh, we were doing uh, the course, uh, right? Yes. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, how about uh, some campus changes through the year? The facilities have changed a lot, haven't they? Was Double E the building it is today? We is that where you were? When you yes. Were here? Okay. Yes. Okay. Now uh, I can't recall exactly what year it was, but. Uh, you know, we used to have a big machinery lab that ran clear across the back of that building. Wow. And that was the first remodeling project that I was the liaison for. And uh, I recall that uh, everything was built to the specifications of the individual who were in charge of those labs at that time, but by the time the thing was completed, somebody else was in charge. <laughs> So it made an interesting situation there. And then the, the, evidently I didn't flunk the course doing that, so when they remodeled the third floor, I got due to be the liaison on that. And when the SEE building went up, out in the middle there, I got to do that, along with uh, Bob Staley deceased now than Bob Staley of uh, materials engineering. Okay. And uh, That's a nice facility. Well, if you look at it closely, <laughs> there's some flaws there. <laughs> but um, uh, in all of those remodeling projects, uh, people that I had met from physical plant and the inspectors and so on knew who I was and I knew who they were and you work together. I, we work together, and uh, each brings us a little different something to the table, but it all it's the same yeah, meal. Yes, right. yes, exactly. yes. Okay. How about diversity on campus? Any comments on that? That's. I would, you know, you're getting into a touchy area. Now. <laughs> well, it, it's changed. It's changed probably. Yes. Yeah, the climate and a lot of but, things. Uh, but everything moves up forward. You know, uh, when I first came here in Double E, speaking from Double E, uh, there was a lot of social events where the faculty and 
the graduate student teaching assistants and so on uh, interacted interacted and there was here again that and the wives got together and they had parties and so on and so forth and uh, then uh, as diversity started this dwindled down mm. and out and uh, there's hardly anything <laughs> that goes on any social activity yes. yeah, it's changed so, a lot yeah what but, what but, about family you have your wife and you have any children i have two okay and did they go to purdue uh the daughter did she okay. went to purdue in nursing okay and does she is she one that lives in town yes okay is she yeah. practicing still practicing as a nurse yes yeah, she's a, a home hospital in the neonatal unit has been there 30 years or so and in this new facility that they're building. Uh, she's been given quite a bit of responsibility in terms of picking out equipment that they need and well, that's that very nice. Thing. Yeah, they're drawing upon her experience and expertise. Yes. yes. Uh-huh. And your other child is a boy or girl? It's a boy. Uh-huh. And he is the uh, safety director at uh, Steel Dynamics at Pittsburgh. Mm. Okay. So we get down there to see him, and his uh, his wife is dean of education at Butler. So he lives in Annapolis. But he lives works in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Oh, Pittsburgh. Oh, okay, okay, I see. Yeah. Okay. Now he goes out toward Pittsburgh a number of times Does traveling he? because they have plants in uh, Roanoke, Virginia, and uh, Hibbing, Minnesota, and all over, and of course. Uh, Steel dynamics is one that takes the stuff out of junkyards and makes steel out of it. So they own a few junkyards and he's <laughs> Rex R. Uh, ins- right? inspected. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, now let's move on. Uh, Post Purdue years, tell us what you've been involved in since you retired. Well, tell, you, I've still been involved with the athletic department. I've still been involved with there was involved for a while with the Hall of Music. Uh, I have the farm, but of course that's cash rented. But I still go down there, and I still go down for some fertilizer of the cattle type that I use on my garden here. And uh, I do have a summer place in Michigan, although... uh, You stay there for the summer? Oh, not for the whole summer, no. My wife, she can go up there for a couple of weeks, and then she's ready to come home, okay. come back home. But uh, she used to take her bridge club up there for a week in uh, August, and uh, they'd play sure. bridge for a solid week. And, uh, so that requires some maintenance. You go up in the spring, and you open. You go up in the fall, and you close. And uh, Sometimes you go up in the uh, summer for a couple of weeks, and so on, and it's... Uh, right in the middle of what you'd call the fruit belt in Michigan. If you go up at the right time, you can pick strawberries, you can uh, pick black cherries or sweet cherries, uh, you can get apricots, peaches, mm. black and red raspberries, uh, anything you'd want. Any canning? Does your wife do canning? No. Uh, With all that around? Well, uh, you just enjoy it while we, it's there. We used to pick an awful lot of black cherries up there right off the tree, and then we would package them up and bring them back down here, and I'd give them to members of the clerical staff and double E or things like that, and uh, you'd be surprised how much goodwill that bought you. <laughs> Today they do it in zucchini. Everybody has yeah. zucchini. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's but, nice. Uh, there's Nothing like standing in the middle of a 40-acre field of strawberries, and there's strawberries as far as the eye can see, and you can pick them for 10 cents a quart. Super. Oh. And, uh, what it's now like. They, now, they don't travel as well as the cherries do, but... Uh, and then in the fall of the year, I used to go up around DeMott and pick up uh, cantaloupe. Mm. And uh, at uh, the cantaloupe up there, I could get... Uh, 10 bushel at a time, and there were 15 cantaloupe to the bushel, and I would uh, 
put them in my garage and tell members of the clerical and the service staff to come down the alley and uh, help themselves after work. And there again was yeah, nice. really nice. Yes, it's nice to share things like that. Yes, yeah. very good. Right. Um, do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? That you tradition. Mm -hmm. I would say commencement. This is a happy time for the parents, a happy time for the students, and uh, it is the greatest unrehearsed show that ever appears in musical from the standpoint that uh, uh, I would have to say that would be my favorite uh, tradition. Let me ask you on the commencement. Years ago, did they have the, the TV thing up there so that you can see them walking across the stage? That uh, evolved. Oh, okay. It evolved. Um, there used to be special places down on the main floor where they had the cameras. But uh, I'm sure that now it's... Uh, they still had the screens up and they flashed the names on and mm -hmm. slides sure. okay. that were put in up in the projection booth. Uh, but uh, it's evolved into a much nicer, well, where they take the, the tape of the whole thing and then sell the tapes. Yes, I understand that it's nice, yeah. yeah. And I've also heard from, from students' parents as well that they get its hand given to them, the diploma, mm -hmm. and which is really nice. Oh, yes. So yes. following up what you're saying, it's that personal, nice way touch. Yes, they have the diploma right there in the case, and if you happen to uh, not graduate for some reason or other, you still get a case. There's no diploma in it, but uh, so the audience doesn't know but what you... Right, so that's it's exactly. Right. That's I would say it's, uh, it's very professional. There is no dry run on this thing. So you've got one shot to do it and to do it right. And uh, it takes uh, it takes a lot of... Uh, but it comes off very well. Yes, but uh, uh, if we back up a few years... Uh, gee, I can't remember the fellow's name now. But he was over in the graduate school, and he used to get the numbers of candidates and so on. And uh, I recall one year we had the thing all marked off, and of course you put the students, uh, or you put the parents in the unmarked off spots, so you For don't you don't have any spares to speak of, and uh, he inadvertently got the morning session and the afternoon session interchanged, and here we had all the seats filled with the candidates and the line was still going through executive building and out into the mall. Yay! Well, that's the last year he did that. <laughs> he, he decided he'd retire. <laughs> But that, uh, fortunately, I, I don't know what the situation was that year. We managed to split them up and put part of them, they weren't all together, but uh, when they marched down and across the stage, we got them together. Yeah, they were right. <laughs> but uh, it caused a little few beads of perspiration to <laughs> crop out on the... Right. It's like an oversubscribed class. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, we, so I used I used to check the, the numbers with the registrar's office at least a couple of times, and then I'd mark them off, and I'd always leave three or four rows, three rows probably, sure. after the last candidate, in case we had. Right. And then you had to police the crowd too, because you didn't want people going down front to take pictures. Uh, so I had to put people part way down in each aisle to keep the pedestrians from <laughs> crossing the road at the wrong time. And uh, 
Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. It was a good run. It was nice. And, yeah. and every and then they, they wanted counts of the tickets that were taken in. And I know uh, my allotment of tickets used to be 35 for those people that left theirs at home so I could take care of them right on the spot and they could get in and see the thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, there were a few years there when uh, they didn't have as many uh, sessions and they used to send them over to the Union Ballroom to watch it on TV over there and that wasn't popular. It wasn't popular at all so then they went to more sessions. Sure. Right. Do you have an outstanding event in your life that comes to mind? And some I would closing things as you I would back. say when I completed my PhD would be my outstanding event because uh, I certainly didn't expect to lose a major professor to industry at that time, and while somebody was willing to take me on, they had different ideas, and you don't know whether you're going to have to go back from scratch or whether you can, some portion of what you've done in two years. And at that time, I was teaching full-time when I, after I finished my master's, and then I went full-time as teaching. So That's I would say that, right. uh, that was a, uh, and knowing that I had been offered a job beforehand and uh, it was just a matter of finishing, and I had uh, looked at several places on the West Coast, but that was an awful long ways from here, and who knows when that's going to fall off in the ocean. <laughs> uh, but California was a popular place for people getting their degree to go at that time. And uh, eventually I just ended up in here, uh, here, even though the humidity is, uh, gets bad in the summertime. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> uh, any uh, closing comments and summary? Anything special you'd like to say? I... A lot of things, you know. I enjoyed the position I was in because I dealt with the professorial staff. Um, but I also had association with other parts of the university. Uh, an awful lot of things went over my desk, which gave you a a different picture. I don't think I could have done a lot of the things that I did if I hadn't been a member of the professorial staff <laughs> myself. If I'd been just an administrative assistant with maybe a bachelor's degree or something like that. Uh, I got to meet and work with a lot of interesting people. It was very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. But I think I got out at the right time. <laughs> time to do something else. Well, yeah. move on. Right. Not, not in terms of. No, just a little, little change, like a little change yeah, in, yeah. in the daily yeah. daily yeah. activities. Yeah. yeah. My wife now isn't uh, as healthy as she once was, so I'm doing a lot of domestic stuff <laughs> that uh, I wouldn't have had an opportunity to do before. And uh, a lot of the things I've done, you would have to have to be there to really enjoy them. Right. Some I've been it's been suggested several times that I should write a, a book about my experiences in the music hall or with the athletic oh. department or with some of those. But unfortunately, if you weren't there, you couldn't really appreciate uh, the situation. That's right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You might still give that some thought. Mm -hmm. It would be nice. Mm -hmm. 
Well, very little. <laughs> My penmanship isn't what it used to be. <laughs> Oh, I want to thank you, Professor Shelley. This has been really, really nice. I really appreciate that. Well, it's very good.